Uh, our next speaker is Lisa Bronner, and she is of the Bronner family, Dr. Bronner's All One Soaps, and she has been part of this family business since she was a little kid, and they have been sure. living a non-toxic lifestyle, and she is really, truly an expert in how you can remove a lot of these cancer-causing chemicals from your lifestyle, and she also blogs at goinggreenwithabronnermom.com, so you can follow her there and learn more. But today, we're just going to enjoy her presentation and learn a lot more about how we can reduce our risk of disease by going green. So thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you, Robert. All right, well, welcome. You guys have had some fabulous presentations this week I, or this weekend. I've been looking at your schedule and I got to hear the last one and wow, uh, there's just a lot to learn here and that's fantastic because the fact of the matter is you have to look at your health as a big picture. And today I'm gonna talk about personal care products and home care products, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. And so if this is all you do to change your life, you're gonna be missing out. However, I hope that you have uh, gotten a lot out of the other presentations on food, on exercise, on de-stressing your life, because it, we are whole beings, the inside, the outside, the mental, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, it all adds up to us as a whole person. However, I do hope I'm able to shed some light and help you out in the area of greening your personal care routine and your home. Now, the fact of the matter is there isn't there are a lot of similar issues between how we clean ourselves and how we clean our houses. And so I am able to talk about these two topics together. One unfortunate thing that both of these areas have in common is a complete lack of oversight by any governmental agency. The FDA doesn't see any of this as a food or a drug. The EPA not really affect, uh, affecting the environment in a way that they're taking notice of. The USDA doesn't really come under the auspices of agriculture. And so the place we need to start is to realize nobody is looking out for us in this. There is no oversight of the chemicals and the ingredients that go into personal care products and that go into home care products. And often any changes that come about are totally after the fact, after something bad has happened. We don't want that to happen to us. Now, if you take a look at this table I have up here, you will notice a whole lot of ingredients, uh, of products that you can use to clean yourself, take care of yourself, and take care of your health. I am not going to tell you which of these are good and which of these are not. My goal is to give you the tools to be able to look at products and figure it out for yourself. So I bought these just to show the wide range of products available uh, that you can use to beautify yourself in your home. And I hope that you're able to have some more tools to make good decisions for yourself. Now, one of the best movies that I feel addresses the issue of the lack of oversight of the cosmetic industry and the fact that we really need to be looking in the ingredients on our own is the 1989 movie Batman with Jack Nicholson and Michael Keaton. And if you remember this movie, Jack Nicholson as the Joker had a dastardly plan to take over the populace of Gotham City and wipe them out with a beauty product he called Smilex. New and improved Joker products with a secret <coughs> ingredient, Smilex. And it made you smile. It also kills you. The problem with this is that it's not too far from the truth, is that there is a whole lot of things in our products. You put something happy on the label. It's kind of pretty, a beautiful blue gel, and people just buy it, saying, somebody's got to be making sure this is good and nobody is. So the starting place is to realize that our skin is our largest organ. And anything that comes into contact with it has the potential of going through it. That's why transdermal patches work for birth control, for nicotine, sometimes for, for other medications. Patches work because uh, things travel through our skin. 
So anything that goes on our skin could end up inside us. The things that you have to particularly watch out for are things that stay on our body. Lotion, sunscreen, bug spray, makeup, things that we wear all day long. It is also important to look at things that we wash off because they are on our bodies for some period of time when we're shampooing or if we are cleaning our house. You know, maybe we're wearing gloves, but maybe not. And when it comes to household cleaners, a lot of them, the additional issue is inhalation risk. And a lot of things can be absorbed through our lungs and even through our eyes. Inhalation is, is one area that there's very little uh, governance on and a an area of great danger. Because anything that is sprayed, whether it's a spray sunscreen or a spray house cleaner, ends up airborne. If you can smell it, it's in the air. And even if you can't smell it, it might be there anyway. Residues on countertops, on bathtubs, if you have kids, if you have pets, they're particularly sensitive to this sort of thing. This is why the issue is important, to green your routine. Now what I mean by green is very simple. Green means it does your body good and not harm. Sounds good to me. Seems like that's how it should be without a special name like green. Part of the uh, process of greening your routine is learning ingredients. And this is just where it gets a little bit frustrating because you feel like you might even need to have a degree in chemistry to understand what some of the in ingredients are. But remember, nobody's looking at them for you. So in my presentation today, I'm going to go through 10 categories, really, uh, 10 ingredients that I want you to look for as you buy products. But that's not really the end of the story, but this is just going to get you started. So I was thinking about you know, all the presentations you've had today and the great exercises. I came in earlier and you were dancing and that was really neat. And I thought, huh, I don't really have an exercise. But then I thought, I do. Because there's one movement about buying personal care products and house cleaning products that's really important. It's very simple. Take your hand, you make a C. You go to the shelf where you're thinking of buying an ingredient and you pick it up. And this is the trick, you flip it around. And you read the back. This is how you need to buy products. It would be so much easier if everything were positioned this way, you know, ingredients facing us on the store shelf. But that's not as pretty. Unfortunately, they look like this. There is nothing useful on this side of this bottle. Now, oh, I realize I picked up a Dove product. I am not maligning Dove necessarily. I want you to take a look at it. However, Despite the fact that it's got a nice contour, a nice clean look, it's got a bird, there's nothing useful on this side. The words deep moisture, nourishing body wash, that does sound very nice. <laughs> but it doesn't actually tell me anything. If everything could be packaged in the same package with the same font, just with a list of ingredients, that really would be a lot more useful. Uh, but nobody is going to hire me as their marketing director with that one. <laughs> However, um, I will point out that on Dr. Brown, it is on the front right there. <laughs> Not that we don't say a lot more on the visual, but that's tomorrow's talk. If you want to hear more about uh, the Dr. Bronner company, you are welcome to come to the business day tomorrow. So if you take a look at this table up here, you might see some products you know. You'll definitely see some types of products that you use. Women on average use 12 personal care products a day. Men on average use nine. 25% of women use more than 15 personal care products a day. This is national average. And that's a lot. It adds up to more than 168 ingredients that your body's being exposed to every day. You need to know what they are. And you need to know what impact they're going to have on your body. So. Shampoo, conditioner, what did you use today? Body wash, mouthwash, hand sanitizer, shave gel, hairspray, sunscreen, deodorant. How many of those are on your body right now? Leave on products, deodorant, makeup, lotion, sunscreen. 
the issue of uh, house cleaning products is even worse because um, the, there is, uh, there's been a lot of consumer pressure to put ingredients on personal care products. So for the most part, they're there on the back and they look like gobbledygook, but they're there. There's not the same on, uh, there hasn't been the consumer pressure yet on house cleaning products. So a company might say, we're transparent, we tell you what's in our product, but really what the ingredients will say is a surfactant, a water softener. That's not an ingredient, that's a type of ingredient, but there's a lot within surfactants. I mean, Castile soap is a surfactant. Detergent is another surfactant. Sodium lauryl sulfate is a surfactant. These, this, that does not tell you enough. So ingredients. So I'm going to need you to hang on to your hat. You might want to get out your cell phone because you might want to take pictures of the ingredients that I'm going to talk about, unless you're taking notes, which is fantastic. So a mom I was talking to at my daughter's school the other day, didn't know her well. When I don't know somebody well and they don't really know what I do, and actually she didn't know what I did at all, she, um, I feel weird, you know, like jumping on the bandwagon of, do you know what's in that? Um, and scaring her with talks of carcinogens and, and organ toxicity. However, she happened to mention that the other day she hadn't had a time for a shower, and so she had used a dry shampoo. Nothing inherently wrong with dry shampoo. She had used a dry shampoo, and she noticed after that she got a migraine. And so she knew that the dry shampoo caused a migraine in her. Great. The next day, she noticed that when she used her hairspray, she got a migraine. And so the hairspray gave her a migraine. And so I said to her, have you considered not just banning those products and going and trying another, another product, but look at the ingredients and start to identify where's the overlap between those two products, hairspray and dry shampoo, that might be causing the migraine. Because if you take the time to do that homework of comparing the ingredients and saying, aha, that's the overlap, both of those have whatever ingredient in them, then it'll save you a lot of money in not buying the next product. Oh, that gave me a migraine. The next one, the money you'll spend, the time you'll spend, the pain of having a migraine. So although this may sound like a lot of work up front to learn ingredients and to read product labeling, think of the time you're going to save in not being sick, not feeling sluggish, not having even the chance to go to a doctor, the time, the expense. So a little money, I'm uh, sorry, a little time up front is gonna save you a lot of time in the long run. So let's look at some ingredients. Okay, so ingredients to avoid. If you look at conventional products, you're going to see most of these. But products without them do exist. The top one, penetration enhancers. This means that although these ingredients, polyethylene glycol and propylene glycol, they themselves don't cause a, a necessary physical harm, they allow other ingredients to penetrate deeper. They enhance the penetration of other ingredients. It's like they open up the pathways through our skin for other things that are more problematic. Uh, PEG is one that it's, it's ubiquitous, you see it everywhere, unless you're taking the time to buy um, uh, products from companies that really care. The next category of ingredients are, oh, actually one more thing I wanted to say. Both of those, polyethylene glycol and propylene glycol, are petroleum ingredients. They're petroleum derived ingredients. Petroleum is cheap. Despite the fact that it's destructive to the environment and it's not sustainable, it is cheap. And until it becomes not cheap, companies are still going to use it. And so both of these are extracted from petroleum and, not, and so that, I mean, there, there's a wild card element there because in a minute we're gonna talk about contaminants. And when you extract things from petroleum, you have a great chance of contaminants. So the next category, endocrine disruptors. Have you wondered why there is a skyrocketing incidence in our society of hormone imbalances, fertility issues, which is back to hormones, with 
um, weight gain, which is tied to our thyroid gland, which produces hormones. It is because we are putting things commonly on our body, thus in our body, that are disrupting our endocrine system. So parabens, parabens are preservatives. So those will be the precursors, methylparaben, paraben, butylparaben, propylparaben, and ethylparaben. Don't ask me to say those again. But those are their preservatives, very common, not uh, I'll find them in baby products. I'll find them, my daughter was, when she was a baby, she was using um, the, the first toothpaste, the one that's safe to swallow, and it had parabens in it. And I'm, of all the people that would be the most vulnerable, children and women, would be the top. And here it was in children's products. So parabens, um, octanoxate, that is a sunscreen ingredient. Fortunately, it's becoming much less common. It's a huge hormone disruptor. It, um, it, it increases the production of estrogen, which for a boy or a man, that really is an extra problem for their reproductive development and a man's fertility. So octanoxate is one that should not be in sunscreen or anything, especially if you think about sunscreen, where we are leaving it on our bodies all day long. Um, that is a particular problem. This third one, this third one is the problem, fragrance. The problem with fragrance is that it is protected as a term and it is considered proprietary, which means companies don't disclose what's in it because they'll say, well, then somebody will steal our fragrance. Because it is proprietary, things go into their fragrance that have nothing to do with fragrance, but they don't want to disclose them as long as they're under a certain percentage. And so there are the potential of 3,100 different ingredients that could be in that one phrase, fragrance. And fragrance sounds lovely. I mean, that's what a lot of the reasons we buy certain products is because we like how they smell. But that's where the, a lot of the dangers are hiding, is in the fragrance. And even if you think, oh, I buy unscented. Uh-uh. Unscented products have masking fragrances to disguise it. So it's unscented to your perception but it has masking fragrances in it. Uh, phthalates, that word is pronounced phthalates, uh, are one of the things that are commonly in fragrances. They, as I said, they don't have to be disclosed. You will not see the word phthalate on an ingredient list. <coughs> but the problem with phthalates is again that endocrine disruption linked to birth defects in boys. And they tested pregnant women, and when they found the presence of phthalates, in their body, they looked at the at the uh, boys when they were born, and there was all sorts of problems with undescended testes, malformed testes, all sorts of things that are might affect them for the rest of their lives. Now, I'm increasing, in my opinion, in severity here. The other thing is that a lot of uh, the upcoming ingredients overlap. Into, into different like badness categories here. So coming up next, hydroquinone. Uh, hydroquinone um, has the issue of organ system toxicity, uh, which means that it particularly impacts the liver. It's been tied to the formation of liver tumors. And hydroquinone is a skin lightener, so you will find it in products that are meant to lighten your skin. Uh, primarily, and so it, it's also said to increase the risk for cancer because if you're lightening the melanin in your skin, then your skin has less protection against the UVA and UVB rays as well. And then the last category that I'm going to talk about today, and this is the huge one, the incidence of cancer in our society is skyrocketing, and people are saying, I don't know why, I don't know why, why, you know, is it because we have better diagnostics? No. Is it because we're living longer? and therefore more chance for cancer to develop? No, it's because we bought the, 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 the motto, better living through chemistry, after World War II, we had all this, this, um, these petroleum byproducts, what are we gonna do with them? Oh great, let's put them in our personal care products. And so, they are carcinogens. Carcinogen means linked to causing cancer. 
The category of ethoxylates, ethoxylation is a process. It's a process that increases the um, shelf stability of a product. And so in an ingredient, you, you can tell if it has been ethoxylated if it has the syllable F in it. So for example, sodium lower S sulfate. If you've ever wondered the difference between sodium lower sulfate and sodium lower S sulfate, it is that sodium lower S sulfate has undergone the process of ethoxylation. Uh, once again, polyethylene glycol that I talked about earlier, also causing uh, penetration enhancement. Um, anything with the phrase xenol could have it too. Ceteris, olus, miris, I don't even have them all up there. Okay, what's the issue? The issue is, in this process of ethoxylation, a byproduct is created. This byproduct is called 1,4-dioxane. This will never be on a list of ingredients because it's not added to the product. It's not, it's not like, you know, put in. It is, a, it is a reaction and it's a byproduct. It can be stripped out of a, of a finished product by a process called vacuum stripping, but you don't know if that has happened and you don't know if it was fully effective. So 1,4-dioxane is a known human carcinogen. No question, it is a known human carcinogen. In 2009, a scientist went into a drugstore and bought a whole bunch of products off the shelf, pretty similar to what I did here, and tested them. A horrible amount came back positive for the presence of 1,4-dioxane. Mm. Baby products, children's products, products that women, pregnant women would use that really would affect the health of the vulnerable. Since that study came out, there was a lot of reformulation. Now, 22% of those ethoxylated ingredients test positive for the presence of 1,4-dioxane. It can penetrate the skin very easily. 57% of baby products still test positive for the presence of 1,4-dioxane if they contain an ethoxylated ingredient. So because of the unknown of how well did they get the 1,4-dioxane out, avoid ingredients that are ethoxylated. So if you like don't remember anything from this talk, I would find a spot in your brain for those weird terms. So this next one, this next section, MEA, TEA, and DEA, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce what those stand for because they're super long and they're almost always written as this. Um, they are also carcinogenic, known human carcinogenic. <coughs> when you see them in products, people are relying on your being ignorant. Quaternium compound 15, quaternium compounds, they're followed by a number, uh, 15 or, um, gosh, this one I just learned this morning because I only knew about the quats, but diazolidinyl urea, formaldehyde releaser. Same issue as 1,4-dioxane. Formaldehyde is never added to a product. Nobody's going to put formaldehyde on their label. It's a known human carcinogen. However, when these products sit on the shelf, these ingredients, quaternium uh, compounds and urea compounds, when they sit on the shelf, formaldehyde is released. And so even if you tested the product as soon as it was manufactured, it would test clean as far as formaldehyde goes. But if it sits on the shelf in the store, in your cabinet, uh, formaldehyde forms. Now, where are you going to find these? What kinds of products? Weird products? No. So ethoxylated ingredients, Those, a lot of those are nice, bubbly, foaming ingredients. Surfactants. And surfactant on its own is not a bad category. As I said, it's a surface active agent. A soap is a surface active agent. However, these ones, they're, they're put commonly in, in shampoos, in body washes, in anything bubbly because we like our bubbles. It feels good. Kids like bubbles. And these ones bubble really well. However, I don't think it's worth the risk. Um, these ones, the MEA, TEA, and DEA, you'll see them all over the place. Quaternium compounds, you'll see those also primarily in shampoos. <coughs> yes? It is. It is. It doesn't have the carcinogenic possibility at all. Um, the issue with sodium lauryl sulfate is that it's drying to our skin. And it's actually why it's not used in um, products that people prefer to, or companies prefer to put in the Lorath because it's not drying to our skin. 
power of time, yeah. Um, so sodium lauryl sulfate, it, it can be irritating to your skin. Um, one of my, um, two of my children actually, uh, they were getting canker sores in their mouth and I noticed that their toothpaste still contained SLS, sodium lauryl sulfate. And when I put them on an SLS free toothpaste, it cleared up, so. Uh, which doctor brought us in? Anyhow, um, so yeah, so, so uh, SLS, which is lauryl sulfate, does not, is not a carcinogen, uh, but SLES, as sodium lauryl sulfate is somewhat sometimes written, is, uh, can be contaminated. <coughs> so what do you do? What do you do to, uh, to avoid these things? Well, one is that, that risk, risk flip. You, you have to spend some time in the aisles and you have to spend some time looking at what you're buying. However, if you go home and throw out everything you own, um, you'll probably give up before the week is out because that'll just be frustrating and way too much work and your head will feel full. How, start with one product. I'd recommend starting with a leave-on product. What product do you leave on? And um, look at the ingredients there, find a better alternative. You have to be your own advocate here. As far as personal care goes, there is a, p a chance of getting a certification, such as USDA Organics. The only way the USDA has any oversight into personal care is if they are certified organic. Otherwise, they don't care. Uh, Dr. Bronner's, in fact, uh, was the pioneer to um, get the USDA to certify body care products and not just food. Initially, they said, no, we don't want a mess of body care products. So initially, Dr. Bronner's went and certified under the food grade standard, which is uh, stricter, but this one still means a good bit. NSF um, the, uh, means it can contain organic ingredients. The whole thing isn't organic. As far as the term organic goes, you have to be savvy though, because people can use the word organic on a product and it's not all organic. Maybe the product's name is organic. Maybe, um, it says, uh, there was one product, I, I am gonna pick on someone because this one is kind of egregious. The, product, the company name was Dr. Organics and they made a Castile soap, which is why it came to my attention. Dr. Bronner, Castile soap, Dr. Organics, Castile soap. Um, but it didn't say it was organic Castile soap. And so, uh, the, but it definitely implied that, but it didn't say it and that was their you know, <coughs> defense against no, we're not mislabeling or misleading. So you have to be careful to watch that use of the word organic. The other thing that you need to, that you can do is to educate yourself with resources. I'm going to put this up here just to, so you can get the website. So take a picture of that. And then I'm going to show you these websites uh, because they are wonderful throws of information. You can spend more time on there than you would think you'd be interested in spending, but they're so interesting and very, very well done very accessible to somebody who doesn't have a degree in chemistry. The first one is the Environmental Working Group. So the Environmental Working Group is a nonprofit, a, a, third, a third party resource organization. They do not accept a corporate sponsorship. Um, think of them as like the consumer reports of, of personal care products. And they have recently um, started addressing issues of food and home care, which is great. They run the Skin Deep database. The Skin Deep database is where you can go when you're, here, you're thinking of a product in your house that you have, um, you know, the shampoo, and you can go and plug it into their Skin Deep database and it gives you a rating from one to 10 of how safe it is. One to three or one to two is, is low hazard. Nope, what is three? Even zero, right. And then it has moderate hazard and then extreme hazard. It can also tell you things about ingredients. Uh, so it's got like 60,000 products in there. Yeah. It might. But the thing is, if, if it doesn't, if you can find the ingredient list, you could plug in a specific ingredient and find that. Yeah. Um, and they also have a guide to healthy cleaning. So the Skin Deep database is all personal care products. And the guide to healthy cleaning as fabulous you know, wealth of information as far as what you're using to clean your house. The campaign for safe cosmetics is, is similar. Uh, kind of a little more geared towards women, um, but still very good as far as uh, ingredient breakdowns and talking about issues to watch out for. Uh, in case you are a little old school and you like some books, 
I've got two books that I recommend, one on home care and one on body care. Stacy Malkin wrote this book, Not Just a Pretty Face, The Ugly Side of the Beauty Industry. And it's um, a bit of an expose about what's really going on with their lack of oversight. And then Clean House, Clean Planet by Karen Logan. It's like a cookbook for house cleaning. And it's not just recipes, but she gives analysis of how good is it to a conventional brand, how much does it cost compared to a conventional brand. Very easy to use, lots of information. Let me show you what these look like. So this is a campaign for Safe Cosmetics, and they have ingredients that you can learn more about, at like the 1,4-Dioxane, not listed on ingredient labels, the contaminants. You can do ingredient searches on here as well, um, filter by product type, like you, know, you want to find out about shampoos or something like that. Um, lots and lots of information on that website. Yeah. It is. It is. Now, would all of the beauty on that product have to be organic? No. No. No, that's a great question. So um, if there is a percentage breakdown, so 95% uh, of the ingredients have to be organic in order to be able to put that organic seal on the front of a product. Um, if 70% if of the ingredients are organic, then you can have that on the back of the product, or it can say made with, made with organic ingredients. Can you get that with that? Is it on my back? No, okay, no, it can't, the, the label can't be on it at all, but it can say made with. The reason I'm looking at ours, because you will <laughs> not see the USD organic seal on ours, is because soap is required to be made with a mineral, and a mineral can't be organic because it's not botanical. So you have to make soap with lye, potas uh, sodium hydroxide, or potassium hydroxide. And so it knocks us into the 70% category. So we are able to say made with organic oils, says it right there. So, but if you see, if you see the USDA logo, as you were pointing out, it means that 95%. So if you're giving me a product in the back, your product would be? More, I mean, more would be, yeah. Yeah, well, as I, I misspoke, if, if it's 70%, it will not have the seal, but it is allowed to say made with. Or you might see asterisks in the ingredient list um, that will then go down to a line that says organic or something like that. Yeah? Uh, is there a sunscreen that you recommend? Sunscreen is the worst thing ever because in, uh, companies will reformulate every year. Uh, so, for example, I said that one, didn't I? Yeah. Okay, banana boat. Banana Boat probably has no less than 50 different types of sunscreen every year. Different SPFs, different features, sport, kids, tear-free, sensitive skin, face, you know, different types of sunscreen. And so every year I spend about four hours identifying what brand of sunscreen that year has the ingredients I like. So me, I always buy one that has, that has mineral-based um, active ingredients, titanium dioxide and zinc uh, oxide. If there are chemical sunscreens that are okay, um, but I wasn't going to plop those words on you because they're all very similar, octanoxate, octophthalate. Uh, so, you know, there is a great breakdown of sunscreen on this website, the Skin Geek database. Highly recommend their sunscreen analysis. Does it say that there? No. Yeah, well, yeah, okay, so they have a, a menu up at the top that says sun. Very, very helpful. Um, yeah, because I, I will think, oh, okay, I identified, you know, a brand that I like, uh, and then the next year they have reformulated. The other craziness is I, I happen to notice that, once again with this, I said I wasn't going to pick on brands, but, um, that um, Banana Boat makes spray sunscreen as well, and they have a spray sunscreen that looks like this exactly. It says, kids, UVA, UVB protection, sunscreen, lotion, 50. Looks like this, everything. The ingredients are different. You'd think, oh, one spray, one's lotion. No, the ingredients are different. They're both SPFs, 50, that's true. 
Uh, so you, sunscreen is, you know, I, I spend more time on sunscreen than I do on anything else. So this is an example of what you'll get on Skin Deep um, in that search bar up there. It's, it's more than 60,000 products. You can either plug in an ingredient or a contaminant like 1,4-Dioxane and read some more about it. Or you could plug in, you know, um, Clairol shampoo or L'Oreal eyeliner and uh, see what they have to say about that. Uh, you can either plug in things you have or they have a way that you can search for like safe eyeliner or, or safe uh, soap and they'll give you a bunch that are very, very low hazardous. Okay, so this is the, the same company or same, same group, the Environmental Working Group. This is their healthy cleaning guide. So helpful. Uh, you'd be surprised at some of the products that they give, they slam because they especially slam products that sort of pretend to be healthy, pretend to be green, and yet are worse. Um, so they have great uh, ways, to top products, how to read a label, especially a label on cleaning products that says very little, but how to get the most information out of it. I highly recommend that you head over there. And then, as I said, these two books, Not Such a Pretty Face, The Ugly Side of the Beauty Industry, and Clean House, Clean Planet, uh, this one is, is more of a read about what the issues are and what's going on there, uh, whereas Clean House, Clean Planet is more recipes and let's get started. So, uh, yeah, I feel like I give you guys so much information that I've been raving over, which is why I'm not going into the ingredients in, in home care products, um, although, as I said, you've got to find it out for yourself because it's not, nobody's looking out for you. But I want to give you the opportunity to continue asking questions, and hopefully I can help. Yeah? I don't think so. Yeah. Oh, she asked if there was any difference between the green USDA organic label and the black USDA organic label. I think it's just, uh, it's just preference on the label. If somebody knows, you, you, you know? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So m the black one might indicate more organic, 99%. Okay. But I mean, once again, how would you know that unless you had done research? That's ridiculous. I mean, what we need to do. Yeah. Oh, here. Here we go. Here. Okay. The question is, is there a good makeup line? Um, so the issue with makeup is, is often... Um, the parabens and the fragrance have the phthalates in it. And the other issue with makeup, of course, is we leave it on all day. And so it is a, a particular area you want to pay attention to. Um, there are a couple different uh, brands that, that I like and use. Bobbi Brown, actually, if you want to spring for that, is uh, she pays attention to ingredients. She's not perfect but she knows the big ones to avoid. She knows the ones on here to avoid. So a mineral fusion is a more everyday line that is doing a pretty good job of um, avoiding the big bad ingredients. And I say that, you'll probably go find something that's not on because products change all the time. But those are two that I generally have you know, been able to buy because they pay attention to their ingredients. That's a great question. There is, uh, so the question is, how would you use Dr. Bronner's soaps for cleaning? Um, I didn't want to make this sound like an advertisement for our company, so I, I somewhat intentionally didn't talk about ours. However, none of those ingredients that I mentioned are in, in ours. Ours are very understandable. They're made with olive oil, coconut oil, palm oil, and if you want to see how palm oil can be produced sustainably and ethically, please go visit our website. We have a couple great videos about our palm oil production in Ghana where there is no rainforest and no orangutans. So um, <laughs> in your bag, in fact, is my green cleaning guide. Um, I'm not sure who put it there, but somebody I work with did, and that is fantastic. So in your bag is a cleaning guide I wrote that tells you how to dilute Dr. Bronner's products for various household um, cleaning purposes. And I don't have one up here. Does somebody have it by chance? Oh, wait, yes, I do. I'm going to bring that to us. 
Okay. Okay, so this is what is in your bag, Lisa Bronner's Green Clean Guide. And in here are recipes, and I put a little hole in it so you can pin it inside your cleaning cabinet. So for example, you could make a all-purpose spray with a quart of water and a quarter cup of Dr. Bronner's Castile Soap. Pick your favorite scent or use the unscented and add your own uh, or use tea tree because tea tree has the uh, tea tree essential oil, which is an extra boost. So a quarter cup in a quart of water for our all-purpose spray, half cup in a large load in a normal washer, not the AC, um, a half cup of, of the soap. Uh, let's see what else do we have on here. Dishes, hand washing dishes, can't use it in the dishwasher, it's too bubbly. Hand washing dishes roughly works out to about a one to, one to 10 ratio. Um, I just probably do two good squirts in my sink of water to wash my dishes. Um, windows, you don't want to use this in windows actually. Mopping, half cup of Dr. Bronner's Castile soap in three gallons of hot water. Uh, I mean, the things that can clean your body can clean your house. That's the thing. We've gotten to this age of specialization, which is saying that what we use to clean our bodies is different, needs to be different than what we use to clean our house. That doesn't make sense. What we use to clean our face needs to be different from what we use to clean our body. That doesn't make sense either. Dirt is dirt, and it reacts the same way with surfactants that, any, that regardless of where the dirt is. Now, of course, you want it to be gentle if it's on your body, but you want it to be just as gentle if it's in your house. So, uh, and this is great if you have kids, you put the kid in the bathtub, you wash them, you take the same bottle, and while they're playing with their toys, you wash their bathroom, and it works really well, and you get, you get two things clean in one go. So, um, so do take, take a look at this, and my blog has a lot more recipes on it. Uh, so, yes. my own and so um, and I I haven't I, d I haven't like nailed down the recipe enough to share it out there because once it's out there it's out there so but I make my own and it works really well with a combination of coconut oil uh, I personally like to add cocoa butter and shea butter because coconut oil can be well it's liquid at room temperature uh, and then cornstarch and baking soda and I'm sort of working with the um, ratio there uh, instead of cornstarch, you could use arrowroot powder if you want to avoid corn. Although if you use organic cornstarch, you won't get the, the annoying food. But um, so that's the solution I have found because no conve well, conventional ones have the problematic ingredients, and then the healthy ones don't work. I mean, <laughs> and so I'm, I make mine up. And I, I use my double boiler. I melt the oils, mix them with stuff, and keep it in a jar. Uh, however, so the only thing I have ever bought that works just as well, or, or not just as well, almost as well, is the crystal, the crystal deodorant that you wet and use. Um, but yeah, you're right though that you have to settle for at least no odor, but to stop the perspiring, well, first of all, our bodies need to perspire, so there's that too, but I understand you don't always want to perspire. So, um, but that's a harder one to find. But yeah, but I make my own and I'd encourage you to do the same. Yes, sir, in the back. For if you wanted to use um, responsible products for the editorial <coughs> service, do you offer these in large, you know, industrial size containers? We do sell these in five gallon totes. Uh, you, yeah, you can, or, you can order through our website, okay. um, or if you have a supplier that you work through, they can order it for you at their wholesale rate. So yes, we do, we do, yeah. Yeah, it does say not to, and I, yes, I will be happy to. So this soap does not work in traditional, regular pumps because this soap has just enough water in it to keep it liquid, which is, it, it has 33% water. Any less water and it starts to solidify. So when you put it in a pump, the air is getting into the pump apparatus, and when there's a little bit of the soap in there too, the water's evaporating, the soap's becoming solid inside the pump, and if, if you use it 
most likely before it clogs completely, it'll clog partially and cause soap to shoot out mm -hmm. in your face, uh, <laughs> probably on a guest, and um, you, you'll be mad at us because. <laughs> so, um, however, it works great in a foaming pump, in a foaming pump. So the foaming pump dispensers, if you dilute it, I've had people say one part soap to three parts water. My cousin says one part soap to eight parts water. Whatever works for you and your pump, um, it works great in foaming pumps. And could you ask um, about pumps? The different soap. Yeah, the different soap. Is that yeah. black? With the black pump. Black pump. Yeah. If you, if you buy the 24 ounce, it, it's meant to dispense what you would need to wash your whole body. And the 12 ounce one, 12 ounce bottle dispenses a little bit less. So that's our sugar soap. And it doesn't evaporate as readily. The sugar helps um, and we have, it's got grape, grape juice in it and soda water. Um, it's more moisturizing. So if you ever find our Castile soaps are too drying, the sugar soaps work really well. So yes, those ones work in pumps and you can transfer them if you'd like. We do sell a half gallon size. Yeah, yeah, you want to know what's in them. You want companies to be transparent. Yep, but I do agree with what's on our label. Don't put them in pumps. Yeah. No, because a well-made soap, the question is, will lye get in your eyes and, and cause you to tear up? There is no lye in the finished product mm -hmm. because it's part of a reaction. So soap is really beautiful when it's well-made. Soap is made from oils. You tell that, to, tell that to a child and they think, what, you know, you want to clean the oils with soap. Why do you want to clean soap? You, you start with oils and oils are triglycerides. So I tell my kids who know more about soap than your average child, um, that it looks like a big E. You've got like a backbone of glycerin and three fatty acid chains. It's the, it's the triglycerides. And it w that's what an oil molecule looks like. And so you put in a really strong alkali such as lye, which is sodium hydroxide, or potassium hydroxide, and it blasts that apart. And so you've got these fatty acid uh, chains, and they bond with the hydroxide, the OH, and I'm sorry, they bond with the, with the potassium, with the sodium, and then you have uh, the OH becomes water, you know, bonds with some other hydrogens, and then you have glycerin, free floating. And so a well-made soap, at the end, of all of that is consumed, you have no oil, you have no lie, you have soap, water, and glycerin. You can drain off the glycerin. We don't. We think it makes for a nice, nicer soap. Um, and if you are concerned that you might have some lye left over, we test each batch. You can tell by the pH. If the pH is higher than 8.9, we add citric acid, and that takes care of any free-floating hydroxides that are left over. Soap does have a uh, pH of 8.9. Neutral is seven, 8.9 isn't that much higher, but our eyes don't like anything that's too far away from seven. And so if you get soap in your eye, it's gonna hurt. Uh, it will not cause damage, you need to get it out, um, but it does, it's not a tear-free product. To get, to be tear-free, it can't be soap. So if something is tear-free, it's gonna be a detergent. It could be a fine detergent, but you need to look into that for your, for your babies if, or your animals, if that's your concern. Yes? What's the difference between Part of it is water content. However, to get the question is what's the difference between Dr. Bronner's solid bar soap and our liquid Castile soap? They're both Castile soaps. And Castile originally meant olive oil soap from the Castile region of Spain. Nowadays, and the way we use the term, it means a vegetable based soap. So there's not going to be um, tallow in our soaps, there's not going to be petroleum products or soap. So it's, it's olive oil, coconut oil, and palm oil. And so the difference between the two is that uh, when you use potassium hydroxide in that soap making reaction versus sodium hydroxide, the potassium hydroxide results in a harder soap. When the, when the fatty acid bonds to the potassium, it makes a harder soap than when the sodium bonds. So uh, we use a different alkali. Some other differences are we add salt to the bar soap, sodium chloride, is a hardener. Uh, it's also actually gentler on the skin, which is why we have salt scrubs and stuff. So our bar soap has salt in there as a hardening agent as well. And then of course it doesn't have the water. So if you ever have a recipe that you want um, 
to grate our castile, our bar soap, uh, and put it in your liquid of whatever, it will have the same impact as if you use our, uh, our liquid. If you're traveling and you don't want liquid bar soap, it's a great option. Yes, ma'am. Um, it does not matter. They all have the same soap base. So um, I use the one that I can put my hands on or that matches my mood or whatever, or matches the season. Um, unless we're having some particular outbreak of whatever, stomach flu, colds, whatever, then I will go for the tea tree. Because as an essential oil, the tea tree essential oil is an antibacterial oil. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess I take back my first answer. There is a difference. The tea tree has an extra tea tree power. That's okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I did it too. No, it's so diluted in there. It's so diluted. But if you were to dilute it that much in a pump, so the question is, will it, will it clog a spray bottle? I was talking about making your all-purpose spray out of this. Uh, if you put, if you dilute it a quarter cup and a quarter of water, it's so diluted that it will not clog your pump of, of your sprayer. Um, however, if you diluted it that much in a conventional pump, it would squirt. Like, it'd be too liquidy, you know, because pump soaps are thicker. So, yeah. Yes. Soap berries. They're not used in our soaps, no. The soap nuts. Um, that's just as just not how not our family recipe. Yeah, <laughs> I mean really, they're, they're they're good. They're good products and, and, and a good way to go. Uh, it's just not. Mm. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Um, if you like the base of one of the scents and you want to add more to it, great, go ahead. If you have your own totally special blend, use our unscented. We call it Baby Mild. It's not just for babies. It is, um, it's just unscented and, you know, put whatever floats your boat in there. Uh, sometimes the oils will rise to the top, so you just have to give it a little shake before you use it. So, yeah, but that's where it gets fun. Yes, in the back. Oh, uh, yes. So the question was, it, it, does Dr. Bronner's make a body soap that isn't meant to be diluted? Yes. We have our sugar pump soap. And it was, we made that as a consumer request. A lot of people saying, I want to put it in a pump, I want to put it in a pump. And people saying it's too drying. And so we made the sugar pump soap. It's got the, it's got shikakai powder in it. So it's like almost an opaque brown. Shikakai powder is, um, it's a bark, kind of like cinnamon. It actually feels like cinnamon. Uh, a natural um, uh, ancient ingredient from India used in shampoos there. It is a very good cleaner and also more moisturizing. It has the sugar in it, which is a humectant, which means it draws moisture into our skin. So, and those, those are in pumps, you just go, go with it. Yeah. Well, Well, the stores do sell them, but they aren't as widespread as these. Like, for example, you can get these in Target. Target does not sell our pump soap. So you'd probably have to go to a, Sprouts. yeah, Sprouts, definitely, um, a more natural store to find those. Or you can order them online from us, but we don't have the lowest prices. I will tell you that right now. We intentionally don't. We don't want to undercut people. We sell at MSRP, but a lot of websites have discounts. So, yeah. The ethoxylated ingredients? Yes. And what does the category of that uh, relate to? Those are carcinogens. Okay. There um, we go. Okay. Yeah, so those are carcinogen. A carcinogen means a cancer causing agent. Oh no, you can, absolutely. Um, so, but you just don't use very much. So some people choose to pre-dilute for every use. I pre-dilute for household uses. In the shower, I'm gonna trust the water present in the shower and on my washcloth 
and basically be diluting it and realize you need very little. And if you're washing your hands, you know, a couple drops, uh, as opposed to if you were buying, you know, do I have a soap up here, right? Is this soap? It's soap, lotion. Okay, well, whatever. If you had if you had a pump soap, it would give you a nice little blob. You don't even need that much of a. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or for my face, just wet my hands, wet my face, wet my hands, lather it up, wash my face. Don't use very much. Yeah, yeah. My grandfather, who was, um, as I said, you can hear more about this story tomorrow, but who was blind and had a heavy German accent, he would say, "Dilute, dilute, okay." Um, to make sure you didn't use too much of the soap. So, yes. No, it's not. Sodium lauryl sulfate has not gone through the process that we call ethoxylation, um, and so it the the eth is is uh, that that part of the chain brings about the possibility of 1,4-dioxane. Sodium lauryl sulfate does not go through that extra step. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have the carcinogenic possibility. It can still be very drying, and it should not be in personal <coughs> care products, um, but it's not cancer causing. It couldn't be in one that had the seal on it, but it, I guess it might be able to be in one that said made with, made with organic oils or made with organic ingredients. Oh, I did. So here, uh, parabens as endocrine disruptors uh, really affect the hormone uh, system, thyroid and stuff, reproduction, reproductive health. Yes, Dr. Bronner said does make a line of lotions. We have an, uh, another wonderful person I work with, or probably the same one, put our entire product line in your in your take back your health bag, um, and so our. Dr. Bronner's has a line of lotions, so it's a very lightweight lotion, great for your face. Um, the peppermint is the best thing on a hot afternoon. Keep it by your desk, put it right here, like perk you up, cool you down, very awesome. We have lotions, balms, body balms, lip balms. Body balms, great for tattoo healing, tattoo um, uh, rejuvenation, like to brighten them up, great for babies and their little creases that get really red and their little folds in their neck. Um, good for their bottoms as well. Let's see. Um, it is uh, coconut oil. Uh, it, we mean, what's the moisturizing agent in the coconut oil? It has hemp oil in it too. All of our products, except the balm, have hemp oil. Maybe not the toothpaste. We make toothpaste, that's our latest one out of last March. Yes, yes. Can you go back to the phosphorus? Absolutely. Yes. So do they all It is possible to have them without it because it's been stripped out. So the process of ethoxylation produces 1,4-dioxane. However, a responsible company, if for some reason they still want to do the process, will vacuum strip out the 1,4-dioxane and it will not be in the finished product. But how do you know? Exactly. That's the question. How do you know? Uh, you can go see what the company says about itself on its website or something, um, but you know, third-party analysis is always a little more reliable than oh, yeah. what someone says about themselves. So yeah, that is the question. How do you know? Yeah, their their priorities. Companies that that use these ingredients, their priorities are not your priorities. Their priorities are to sell a product. Your priorities are to be helpful. That, that doesn't match up. Yeah. Yeah, um, as I said, I kind of hit the top 10. Uh, that, so carrageenan, the issue is, is that it can cause stomach upset. Um, it's, you know, that's not pleasant, but it's, uh, I kind of focused on cancer and, and reproductive stuff and, and hormone imbalance, so it's not, I'm sorry. But if you go to the uh, uh, Skin Deep database and look up carrageenan, they'll give you a great breakdown of it. So uh, most people are not sensitive to carrageenan, but of course, and uh, you know, some people are. Um, and the issue is, if you swallow it, it can it can cause 
coming up that I'm not sensitive to it, but you know, if you are, you know, that's why you have to read labels to find out what you're sensitive to or not. So, yes. So the toothpaste, um, the toothpaste has, let's see, it's got, okay, great, thank you. Sodium cocoate, which is basically coconut oil soap, uh, and it does not taste like soap. It's got uh, um, coconut flour in it, calcium silicate in there. It has, of course, the essential oils as well as baking soda. Um, our ingredients are on our website. And I don't know that I'm missing one. Probably have the cockle rolls in there because that's generally what we use as a preservative. I didn't read that on that. But take a look at it. It's good stuff. No fluoride, no SLS, and the no carrageenan. Yes. Oh, good. All right. Any other questions? Do you have another one? In our products, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I didn't focus on Dr. Bronner's because I didn't want this to be like a infomercial. But um, yes. So let me let me just read you. Um, so peppermint, my grandfather's original soap, still our best seller. Uh, water, coconut oil, potassium hydroxide. As I explained, none of that is left in the final product. Uh, organic palm kernel oil. Uh, read about how we do that well. Olive oil, mentha arvensis, which is part of the mint. Uh, hemp oil, organic hemp oil, organic jojoba oil, mentha pepperita, which is the other part of the mint. Citric acid and tocopherol. So tocopherols are derived from sunflower oil. Any other questions I can answer? All right, well thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. You can um, take your mic off in the back if you'd like. And so I wanted to let you all know that we're going to take the final afternoon break. And I would love for you all just to enjoy the exhibitors for one of the last times. They'll be closing tomorrow. We won't have exhibits. And also, um, I wanted to thank Kiko, who's our doing videography this weekend. We're making some amazing videos to put up on the w Facebook and website of all the back end side of stuff and looking at the exhibitors and interviews with the exhibitors and why they're here and what amazing things they're doing. So Kiko can help you guys out too. Um, and uh, I also want to remind you guys about, um, I mentioned, I showed you guys Tony Bark's uh, headshots that Taylor did. So I just wanted to give some love to um, the guys that are helping me out. Taylor does amazing, wonderful photography, and I, I can't explain how my business changed since I started working with a professional photographer. So I know, I'm only saying this because I know so many of you guys are entrepreneurs, and it makes a lot of difference what um, you put up there on your website. So if you want some photos, definitely um, just talk to Taylor, and he'll give you guys a good deal for this weekend for being here. So go enjoy the exhibits, chat with Taylor if you need anything, um, get some snacks, go to the bathroom, and we'll be back here at three o'clock with Gino speaking on fitness and nutrition and how to improve your results and heal your body.